Let me just check something real quick. Are we good to go here? Yes, we are. <laughs> and we are obviously live, and it's a Tuesday. Uh, oh, yeah, I did say we are live. What should we do with the movies, Star Trek? Today on, wow. Trekland Tuesdays Live, number 279, with me, Dr. Trek, Larry Nimichek, coming at you right here from the heart of Trekland through Portal 47. Right. <laughs> For some sanity, clarity, and the big picture in all things Star Trek. Also, the home, be waiting for it, coming in November of our seventh anniversary, Portal 47 Open House. The open house that's open to all with an extra special guest. The way we do all year long, this one's open to the public. You just have to grab your seat. More details will be coming on that. When we have a guest, we'll have a date. It'll be mid-November now. I can't wait. We've had so many great guests in the past. But thank you for being here now on this Tuesday with us once again. Thanks for all of our TTLers. If you're new with us, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Pop into the chat. Introduce yourself to everybody. I will spin back going to get off on a soapbox here, as always, with the theme. Um, we'll take a short break. I'll do some parent analytics looking. Uh, the streaming service uh, that, uh, the service that looks at streaming ratings in the U.S. And then I will dive into the chat full bore after that. So we're the only show on the webs or TV that make you wait. <laughs> but it's fine because there's off awesome, awesome, great people in the chat if you're new with us and there are from around the world too we get the global the global perspective here and that's why um it's a great place to to remind you about things such as if you're on the cruise coming up the day before or the day after you disembark or embark i'm offering a special edition of our truckland trucks la away days the set schedule not customized but set schedule I can take up to 18 people each day in a set. Just go to LarryMitchek.com and find out all about it. You can click on the link. Same as that was February in July next year. Terrace Cassidy at Geek Nation Tours and I are offering for the first time since 2016 a big multi-day West Coast Away mission. LA and San Francisco this time. That's in July. Click over at geeknationtours.com or learnmitchak.com and find out all about that. But that's coming next year because, my gosh, it's October. We're barreling along. We're almost to the end of Lower Decks. Prodigy's long-delayed back end of first season, which started off as their second season before Prodigy was clumped into 20-episode seasons. It may be a Nickelodeon thing, by the way. All of that to say... It dawned on me this week as we're just kind of a low, huh? I mean, what should we do with the movie Star Trek? Because look, we've had several small stories kind of percolate up. And I'm saying this because I know right now everybody is so focused on the TV series. No one's even caring. I mean, there's a little Sturm and Drang going along with the melodrama of the movies. We've talked about this in little slices along the last few weeks, last few months. I thought maybe it was a good week to maybe get our arms up the story so far and see what's going on with this topic. Because look, we just had, we just had uh, a New York Comic Con and the Next Gen cast say, oh, I'd like a movie. We, we could do one more movie now. We all survived the pandemic. <laughs> we could probably do a movie on top of this. We had so much fun. Okay, but I'm just remembering this also this week we just had a sidebar i love how whole interviews whole articles on the web come out of sidebars that were a piece of a larger interview for somewhere else but um but the two original writers of the chris helmsworth um star trek 4 movie arabic number four right uh jd payne and patrick mckay finally gave a big spoiler about what their script would have been with the reunion of George Kirk and his son, James, Kelvin, Kelvin. Although when you stop and think about it, most of George Kirk's life was prime because the Kelvin didn't start until he lost his ship. So in one hand, um, a 
George and James Kirk team up would have been insightful into George's background. There would have been a lot of canonized background there. So yeah, they in the sidebar, they say it's like Indiana Jones and Last Crusade, right? Where it's Indy and his dad, Sean Connery and Shakari and, and Harrison Ford teamed up. Um, the Last Crusade. So they're talking about somehow finding a time bendy windy thing to get JT and his dad together. Their device of choice, as they reveal, would have been basically a spiffed up big budget version of Scotty's transporter loop from Relics. In fact, they even call out TNG Relics. So good on them for being enough Trek fan to know. Um, I'd like to talk to them someday, even as they move on to Rings of Power here and everything. And they've gone small screen and given up on the big screen blockbusters for now. Um, this whole this whole notion of what if, what if. George Kirk had had beamed himself over to his wife's shuttle at the very last second before the show, you know, when Walona was giving birth to James T uh, in the Kelvin, as the Kelvin timeline split itself off. And that was the, um, that was the uh, conceit of that. He beamed himself over, been, been stuck in a transporter loop, still presumed dead, still presumed uh james t grew up punky without his dad and all that but then they're reunited and they're boom they're off on some some adventure well you know just on its own on one end you can react to that like well that's about as derivative as having little swarm ships attack the enterprise in beyond and everybody slapping themselves on the back while some of us are saying wait wasn't that like a third season voyager episode what do you What's so original about that? Of course, it's the execution, it's the money spent, it's the different characters. It's a, you know, but it wasn't the the most original idea in the world. It was cool, and for everybody that didn't watch Voyager, and there are many millions, um, it was probably new. But there you go. You're starting off with just a big budget, blown up version of that. Now, that's only the initial inciting incident. You're off and running from there with a seven eighths of a plot. So. Okay, and where do you leave it at the end of that movie? Does dad go back away? Does son come? F what happens? But once again, it's been far enough along all of three or four years now <laughs> that they feel safe enough in thinking, well, this is going to be sidebar sideline. Apparently, they haven't heard of the novelization comic graphic novel treatment that it might still be in for as a what if. But again, the idea of the movie is back. And of course, we had a, a month or two ago, we had all the, the uh, hoo-ha about the hoo-ha that no one cared about, about Star Trek IV, actually Arabic IV, being taken off the release calendar because, because real world events. Chris Pine's directing and is going to be busy at the time they would have been prepping that movie. Everybody else is Carl Urban. They're talking about who's too busy to shoot already. Even as the entire Kelvin cast talks about wanting to be involved, well, of course they do. So it's just it's just an uphill slog to do that. This is what you get when you have a movie franchise with actors who are busy doing other projects, none of which Star Trek is, for all of them anyway, is the top-notch franchise. Other things are a bigger demand on their time and their clout rating, their IMDb star, star meter. But once again, you've got, you get a movie, you get a movie. And then I still go back to this. Brian Robbins, who is the head now of the restitched, remerged, reglued Paramount CBS, Paramount Global, Viacom, whatever that's going by this month. But, you know, the old, the old original corporation, as they restitch and get back together, people figure out their turf and who's doing what and who's got, you know, is... Alex Kurtzman going to Rick Berman it and be able to do movies? Is J.J. still got a movie deal? He's, at least as far as last fall, the story that didn't get a lot of play. I did one or two Tuesday live about it. And some of you may remember this, but it was last October. Uh, Brian Robbins talking about, um, who came out of animation, who was there when Prodigy was greenlit. Uh, much less, you know, much less Lord Dex, but a special kinship to Prodigy and for kids talking about, yeah, we've got Alex over here with the TV side. We've got JJ on the movie side, fertile ground, fertile teams of people 
and we saw the confusing uh, array of movie scripts optioned um, from at least three or four people over three or four years, a couple of them at the same time. And some of that's just the confusion of restitching this corporation back, the remerging. But Brian Robbins talked last October about, yes, we need to sort it out on the live action side. Meanwhile, what is wrong with pulling with pulling at animation, live action, big screen feature, not live action, big screen. Talking about doing the same thing that SpongeBob did, jumping out with a movie, which does not hurt the series. It's not the same ego and dynamic, and maybe even this has changed, but the traditional dynamic of once you take a TV cast to the screen, which is something Star Trek pioneered in the first place. Once you do that, you don't go back. They're there. Uh, not so. Not so with animated characters, as SpongeBob has demonstrated, as we may have a few more examples of. They're talking about having, while that happens, have a big screen that you can get kids in to see. Have it be a big screen that totally new fans have no clue about, but they go to see it for the aw shucks because it's kids, the gee whiz, and you've made a ton of new fans through the back door for Prodigy and then all of Star Trek and their parents. But what's interesting is that's a movie idea. Um, the TNG cast are throwing their their hat in the ring. I mean, we've there's all kinds of ideas. The Star Trek realm is so big now. We've got so many former casts and so many actors who are popular, who either could maybe lead a small budget feature or or can only can Star Trek movies only be big block budget blockbusters? Do so they have to compete with Marvel and Star Wars? Can we have a small Star Trek movie, or is that going to always be the realm of cinematic TV? If it's going to be a small movie, then it needs to be on streaming. I mean, part of this is we're in a flexi period. But really what hap what's happening now, and I'm sure they're racing to do this. Nobody liked yanking the Star Trek IV start date from September next year. I mean, uh, the premiere date, the drop date, the opening day. Nobody liked that delay, but it really points up right now, unless there's all kinds of extreme think tanking going on that's all done and they're just not sharing it with us. But it appears to be right now, especially with the Kurtzman TV series driving so much conversation and hopefully profits on the small screen side. I hate to even call it TV because people are streaming on their 60 inch plasmas. But it really brings to mind that that's dry. It's almost like the what's going on with the movies can be a luxury. Now, it can be the luxury that you're that you know you've got to get back to, but it's not a life and death situation. Thank God we have the small screen streaming series and that the world Star Trek and it's a, and the world's impression of it is not hanging by a thread over the, the drama of the next movie and when it's going to time out. So I don't know. This is <clears throat> I have no magic answers. I obviously have no magic insight. Uh, obviously, the studio has no magic insight and it appears that things are still being hashed out. It looks like we're in a very fluxy time. The, the TV train is carrying us down this road, and that's pretty good for our attention spans. We've got 50, supposedly 50 of the 52 weeks a year. We've got Fresh Trek, and that's not even assuming overlaps. So we got plenty to keep us busy and occupied and keep a lot of creatives working and a lot of actors working. But at some point, there's got to be a movie strategy. Maybe there will be, as Brian Robbins said, maybe there'll be a dual track movie strategy. Again, do we have to, do we have to think in 1940s terms, much less 1980s terms, 90s? I mean, you know, before there was the term, Star Trek was doing the the cinematic universe we had two series and a movie at the same time of different subject matter we pioneered all this shit before everybody else took up the mantle long before star wars did and even before mcu so we can get back to that but even our movie track doesn't have to be single tracks it can be a whole yard a whole depot yard getting into the train talk here you know my my dream team, which won't happen. I say it won't happen given the landscape of movie business, but you know, things things have been, a, it's been a very 
subversively uprooting time right now. A lot of paradigms, a lot of a lot of the way things are done has gone out the window on TV, especially. I know the pandemic's done that, and the coming of cinematic TV to, to you know the wall is down. The wall between Mister Mister Paramount tear down this wall between TV and movies, and we've got nobody mind. Actors, writers, directors all go back and forth. Audiences accept it because we're all watching. We're all watching so many movies on our plasmas at home. Uh, yeah, I know on our phones and and laptops and pads, but I'm talking about the ultimate experience now can be sitting at home, pandemic and after. And you really do want to. A lot of people want to still celebrate the in theater experience, and you want to give them something to do that. But it's not such a come down to watch it again at home later, where you can pause and reflect and watch the subtitles. So what about having maybe a third rail? Maybe you have a legacy cast, and what would that be? The Kelvins? Do you do another TNG? Do you do you watch to see what happens with the other shows? Are we waiting for them, the other series? Are we waiting for them to get interdictional? Here's your reward for a job well done on screen and you totally graduate without coming back. You know, if you've listened to me for the last three or four years, my wish list would be basically <clears throat> take short treks and put it on the big screen. Or put another way, what's wrong with anthology movies? Now, if you're building up, you know, the old school, the Vermin era, we had such a such a warehouse so much stuff had been paid for it and stored they they got so much bang for the buck out of their production value. and sometimes yeah it would show up but now that we've got cg visual effects to complement the hardware much less costumes and props um you've got that maybe you can do an anthology movie for less but i'm talking about doing one-offs does every movie have to lead to a series of movies even does every movie have to launch a new franchise of characters? Can we just go explore one-offs? People that don't like being saddled by canon. Okay, you've got the broad brush of the Star Trek universe, but if you want to do two or three or four movies in a series, and maybe they're not the biggest budgets, but they're still very respectable. I mean, look, uh, Star Wars and Marvel are, are maybe taking the lead on this and giving us introspective movies i know it's focusing more on series uh wandavision she hulk but is it time to graduate that over to movies are people only if the philosophy is people are only stepping out of their big screens at home to go see a spectacle in theaters well then maybe not so but if you bring the budget down and you bring the bar of expectations and the pressure to deliver a boffo box office if somehow we can live in a world where that can happen, I would love to see experimental. It would almost be a, a throwback to the 30s and 40s where you're cranking out movies and one of them happens to hit The Thin Man or Casablanca. You happen to hit with one and whether it's the franchise or it's just the actors, then you turn around and you do make bigger budget vehicles out of it. But it's not necessarily the, the end game. I know, I know. It's a pipe dream. It's a pipe dream. I would love to see, I'd love to see it on small screen too, now that we've got cinematic TV. But I would just like to see somebody with the balls and the creative juice, because you know the ideas are out there. All the unexplored areas of Trek, it would basically be a short Treks blown up to movie length and budget. And maybe, maybe you have a, a germination tank <laughs> where you put three or four or five ideas in. You don't announce a movie with all the pressure to make it perfect. Maybe you maybe you throw in, you've got four or five, six folks working on new idea movie scripts at once. And then you can take, not unlike germinating a pilot script the way they did it back in 64 and 65, you put two or three or four, you pay the writer, but you see what they come up with. You look at your TV team, which is what started to happen, you look at the, the team of Trek folks who would love to come in, like McCain Patrick. You, you, you do that. You find the Trek-friendly screenwriters or people on the... You look at your existing and wannabe talent adjacent and let them go with it. And it, well, how much does it cost to write a script and develop one? 
you do that just like you're going to launch a series only you're going to launch a movie series and it can be like the old school golden age of tv you know the desi the lucy desi and the kaiser aluminum hour you have original you have original um you know productions and if it's a series of movies, they don't have to relate to each other. Or maybe there's some clever way they do. But it's not the pressure of launching. We're going to make stars and charismatic icons out of these characters. And they're the next step in the pantheon of Star Trek. This budget and expectation of box office and the and the overwhelm, the overhead of promotion and all that, all that added cost on a movie, does that make it crazy? Or is there some way to do that? And if if you want my great idea, do you have to do that as like short treks, like long treks, <laughs> long anthology treks, and it has to stay on the small screen? I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there. Because apparently right now, there's all kinds of focus grouping and think tanking and budget shuffling going on as far as what the movie franchise is going to look like. Or maybe there have been decisions made. This story in The Hollywood Reporter from last fall, Brian Robbins and Alex Kurtzman are talking like they're really, really serious about doing Prodigy, at least, but doing some of those uh, that they've already talked about it. Um, we're working on several fronts, and obviously Alex is the key for the franchise on Paramount+. Plus. JJ's been the keeper of the franchise on the film side. Um Yes, what the Pricey show is only launching today, meaning Prodigy, both Robbins and Kurtzman are already developing other big ideas, such as a kids and family focused version of Prodigy that includes a feature film designed to bow theatrically, as well as other live action features. Well, yeah, okay. That could live alongside JJ's mystery movie or ST4. I'm just saying that, you know, we've been, we've even made a joke. Is anybody caring? Is anybody paying attention to what's happening on the movie? Or I have anyway. And occasionally I've had some of you pop in and say, I care very much. And whether that was about the Kelvin cast or the concept of Star Trek movies, because whenever people talk about mundane people, people in other franchises talk about Star Trek movies and they always show them compared to Star Wars and the Marvels and even James Bond and, I mean, you know, Harry Potter. It's like, it's not the point, gang. <laughs> it's not the point. That's that's the bonus trip that Star Trek casts do. The Kelvin movies were a little bit of departure there. They were a fill-in. They were a stopgap. They were a survival tactic for those 10, 12 years when a TV Star Trek wandered in the wilderness you know, because the mom and the divorce to settlement uh, took it for granted. But um, that's, you know, that doesn't always have to be the case. Maybe we do develop a line of movies that are their own critter and they stand alone without being, you know, the reward for the cast and a job well done. I don't know. Maybe if they were a series of Star Trek universe anthology movies, maybe we would start to look at them as a movie franchise on their own and comparable to the others. I don't know. Bond came from books. Harry Potter came from books. Star Wars was original. Marvel came from book comics, as, as did DC. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I know, Fast and Furious is a franchise, but I just, I can't. Um, yeah, what do you guys think? I think I think I, I had no idea this was going to be my topic until about two in the morning. I was just going to go, but but I thought you know, sometimes when you have a crumb and a crumb and a crumb and a crumb, sometimes you suddenly have enough to recreate the cake. And I think this is when we pull, you know, when we do it the Trekland way and pull all these crumbs together, it points up a question. I hope the restitched, remarried team that was Paramount and Viacom and et cetera, CBS. I hope those involved are working on a strategy, hammering it out, and we hear about it fairly soon. But if not, there's a whole lot of thinking and probably arguing and probably turf defending going on. And it's going to be fascinating to see where it comes. I don't know what you guys think. You know, we've got the reality of the biz over here to consider. We've got what fans want is that even a quantifiable thing? <laughs> Can we keep that from being a five-way split of opinion? 
whatever's going on, there's all kinds of things to factor in there. Right now we're sitting in the world. We don't know. It's, it's like 2015. We don't know what we want or don't know. And a lot of what we're thinking is probably based on the last iteration. So the new war is coming and we don't want to fight it like the last war. I meant that in the most positive way. What do you think? What do you think? Dump into the chat here. We'll see. We'll see. And while you're doing that, I, of course, want to remind everybody a thank you. A thank you to our TTLers. Thank you so much for my Patreon folks. The TTLers like Diana Hopkins, Lawrence Todd, Keith Rombach, Blaze K, Robin Wilson, and Marie Siegel, Justin Porteous, Nathaniel Robinson, Andrew Jasimski, and Pranakasha Productions. And of course, whoop, our live wires guys, Rusty Harold Hebert, Gun Johnson, Robert McLean, Alan Hoensi, J.R. Poole, Byron Bailey, Dave Gregory, Gay Clevin Lundstrom, and Casey Shafsky. You wonder what I'm talking about with Patreon? It's a way you can support creatives, one-off projects or subscriptions. I have a very simple subscription, five and 10 bucks. We're slowly growing Trekland streaming. Yay. It's at patreon.com slash Trekland live. We're actually finally going to get those old interviews available from Portal 47 out for everybody. We are going to get there. Hey, I also want to remind everybody that the Trek Files is up today. The new week, episode 201. Last week was number 200. And this week with a voice I'm sure you've not heard. She's done one podcast, <laughs> maybe a few years ago. A Hannah Louise Shearer that I was very excited to see her name when I was a kid watching Next Generation because it looked like a sign of things to come. She was only there a half season. She recurred, though. She has a lot of fascinating things to say about first season chaos on the bridge. TNG and even afterward. So check out the Trek Files at facebook.com slash the Trek Files or wherever you get your podcasts of the week. We um, we have the homework. We have the documents. The actual Trek file is on our Facebook page, of course, actually. Once again, be thinking about this. Check it out. You can go to larrynemichak.com or geeknationtours.com. The big 10-day, 10 10-night 10 LA San Francisco location tours our West Coast away mission next July with guests. And these are the first folks out of the back Mike Westmore, Tim Russ, um, Armin Shimmerman, and Bobby Clark. They're different one day guests. We're going to be announcing more, and especially by the beginning of the year, you want to be in on that. And you know what? Whether you're coming to the cruise officially out of LA or not, if you just want to come by, you are welcome to jump in on these. One day day tours, these LA away missions, I call it, when I plan your Trekland Trek for you. So we're going to have buses. We can have up to 18 people the Thursday before, the Saturday after you embark in and out of the cruise. And you're welcome to jump up. We'll leave in Hollywood. Okay. That's on my site, LarryNewCheck.com. You can get to the link for that too. February and March. Yada, yada. And we end with. Just keep watching. Just keep watching. I got to talk about it. I got to talk about it. So you're all wedded. We'll soon have an advance registration, you know, a little sign up just so I know who's coming because we're going to have giveaways and we want to have giveaways. We want to know who's there so we can do the giveaways, including a Picard season two and a lower deck season three DVD set among the giveaway prizes, the door prizes. So you want to jump over and uh, wait wait for me to tell you the official page is signed up, but that should happen within the week, okay? Don't go anywhere. I'm just taking a short break here. But, you know, if you're watching me right now later on YouTube, well, sorry we missed you live. Jump in if you can sometime. Uh, but you know what? You can leave a comment right now just as easily as our chat folks left them live. Please do that. And uh, as we leave you now, if we are, just a reminder, guys, the uh, guys, gals, and peeps, stay healthy, do all the things, even if that means get your flu shot for this season. I know, I know, but COVID's not, COVID's still hanging around. It's laying. Um, I have a pregnant person in my circle, and she is uh, terrified that she's going to get COVID, even though she had it a few months ago, and is loath to take the vaccination um, at this point. So, you know, there's still folks out there to think about. Uh, oh my God. And please stay woke. And I'm not making fun of the term at all. Stay woke to me means stay awake 
and that means stay awake to even what you don't know about. <laughs> so yes, check the sources. Might be some new information. Might be somebody just BSing you. Are they real? And is what they're saying real? Because it's the thick and fast season right now in the States. We're three weeks out from the elections. As always, all I'm trying to say, folks, is uh, trek well. Okay. The Parrot Analytics Gang, as some of you know, as most of you know, if you're new here on Tuesday's Live, the Parrot Analytics is a company. The Parrot Analytics. Parrot Analytics is a company. Their ratings are basically internet-based as a way to give a handle on the relative popularity of all shows, not just the old networks. We have streaming. I mean, did you see who won the Emmys? Yay, Abbott Elementary, the only network entity to go home with a prize, I think. Most everything is streaming, which means most everything does not apply to the old school Nielsen ratings because no one needs ad rates for commercials. And the streamers don't like to give up their numbers. They like to let they like to promote when they want to and not when they don't. So Parrot Analytics has stepped into this breach to try to measure the internet, scouring for mentions. They have a metric called average demand expressions. They publish weekly. They do this in dozens of countries around the world. The US ratings used to be posted every week. Once again, the weeklies have not been updated since the week ending October 7th. However, we did a comparison and the show by show 30 and 60 day trend lines have been updated just to say that lower decks, you know how they, they rate everything as a factor times the average show out of the 600 shows they measure now in the States alone from all the streamers as well as the broadcasting cable. So lower decks is sitting on 18.6 times more popular than the average show. Still makes it outstanding. All, all of the Star Trek series are in the upper 2.5%, just so you know, the way that uh, Parrot measures them. They're at 18.6. They were about 18 two weeks ago. That's their 30-day trend line. They're up 19.2% over six, over 60 days over the last two months, which you would expect. It's a fresh run of lower decks. They dipped a little bit on the last trend and between October 3rd and October 10th, they're back on the upswing. It's minuscule, but people are talking, you know, lower decks up and down the line. Their, their baseline though is 18.6 times as popular. Now here's Prodigy coming out of the gate. It's up 2.5%. It's sitting at 11.7 feels like it's always going to be number two on the animateds and the baby of all the shows, but it's trend line dipped a little bit. Prodigy is debuting in a couple of weeks. So we'll see if we've got any kind of this buzz, the pre-premiere buzz catches up to it. But speaking of pre-premiere buzz, Lower Decks is sitting on 18.6 and running. Picard is at 19.5 and is in hiatus, except for the fact of all this buzz. Yeah about season three and the reunion and the characters and even this movie talk. But people are so excited about the Picard and the tech side and the, the uh, Enterprise F and the Titan A and the one, two, three and the ABC that it's at 19.5. It's been a six point gain and over six in 30 days and over 30 days. Well, from the end of September, can you see my line? You can't see my line. I never, you can't see the line. <laughs> Why do I even try? Why do we even try? There, can you do that? Nope, not even when I, there, boom. That's been their line, if you like to be mesmerized by graphs. That's been their uh, trend line for 60-day averages, all right? So obviously a bump is coming for Picard, and it's not even premiering until February. That's just, that's just the liveism. We have so many animeisms that don't put animation on the same level as live action. I didn't even look at Discovery because I just wanted to look at Picard compared to the current shows coming and going, the animated. It's kind of the nature of the beast. Uh, but there you go. Uh, I mean, good things for all of Star Trek. Again, they're all, as Parrot measures it, they're all in that upper 2.5 that they call outstanding. Uh, occasionally, they venture into the exceptional, which is the upper 
0.4%. So if you're making a marker, if you're making a marker, here's where we hit the chat. And I'm trusting trusting uh every, the audio and video have been good uh so good to see everybody if you have an actual question i'm always most thrilled for actual questions we'll do a little bit of this and see how it goes and if you're new please make sure and pop up I, it's fine to lurk a lot of people lurk for a while but we don't bite everything is all good and we'll see what's going on i'm especially curious if i woke anybody up out of their stupor over star trek movies to see if anybody if we stirred anything, uh, shook anything loose. Did he spark any uh, thoughts here? So hi. hi to everybody. All of our regulars are here. Our regulars across several continents, by the way. Um, <laughs> greetings programs. Kirk unit. Kirk unit. Uh, yes. <clears throat> I saw this just about an hour ago, Christoph. Paramount Plus, it's official. We'll do the yeah, the GSA on December 8th. Also France, I think. Yes. It's in France. What should we do? Hire a director who is at least as much a trucker as the here. Well, that helps. It's a weird dichotomy it's almost been fun after watching star trek battle this head on it's been fun watching what star wars and the mcu have done about having fans in the pro ranks and is it possible to have a professional director writer production designer come in and be an uber hit and you know make the bucks if they weren't already you know a fan of that franchise are they a comic book fan since they were 10 do they have to be you know, it's it's been fun watching the other guys take that brunt on and, and come up with different, or at least who they put in charge of the overall production program. Um, we will see. What, more questions. Horsey's going to bite me now. Okay, you lost me on that one. Am I? Did I just miss it? You know, the other question I meant to add this to in our discussion of the movies is maybe one of the first question about the movies is where are they and why are they not on Paramount Plus? I heard a professional opinion this last weekend. It was actually out in a rare mixing of public people. Uh, and I was talking about, you know, the old, uh, well, they had contracts previously written, but the bigger insight to take away it wasn't just oh darn we signed this piece of paper three years ago it's more a case of they can make more money elsewhere than they can on paramount plus and that's only to say because paramount plus is still a baby streamer that's gaining more eyeballs but compared to netflix or prime especially i think they're all on prime they can make more money for the corporation than they can on the corporation's own youthful, you know, grow. I've said this before. I really want to help Instagram grow, even though it's Facebook, I know, but it's it's the audience on face on Instagram feels more kindred than it does on Facebook. Facebook's just been around for 12 years, even with its ickiness. But if I try to grow the audience on Instagram, if with I go live unannounced. I might have, depending on time of day, I might have five or 10 or 20 people versus my same account going live on Facebook unannounced. I would probably right off the bat have 20, 30, 40, 50 people. It's a little bit that same dynamic. I really want to grow this, but I, how hard is it to drag people over there? Because sci-fi and Star Trek, aside from cosplay, uh, and maybe occasionally a model, but no, not even the model builders. Outside of cosplay, the sci-fi world, the truck world is not big time on uh, on Instagram yet. But it's not that same way. That's what they're facing. They're sitting there. We've got our movies. We want to grow this, but do we waste them over here when we can make more money over here while our baby platform that we control is growing? Anyway, that's a new uh, another insight on the movies. 
Oh, I still don't know about the horsey biting me. That's just weird. But good to see everybody. Ah, 57. The movies could do a film like X-Files and go back to TV. That's true. Yes, that's right. X-Files did that. They were smallish movies. They were never blockbuster movies. But then what do you got? You got Sculler and Sculler and Moldy. Haven't said that in a while. You've got uh, Mulder and Scully and, you know, cigarette smoking. Man, who was who was involved around them in the movies at the time? Um, film in the middle of the TV runs. Yeah. And, you know, they technically people go, what about the Munsters movie? What about the Batman movie? Yeah. Yes. I mean, they were in theaters. They weren't TV movies. They were shot to be TV movies. They were on the budget of a TV movie. They had the existing sets and costumes. The scope was kind of small, except they tried to blow it up. It was kind of like insurrection. It's kind of like insurrection. It feels like they had the scope of the TV show trying to stretch it in two or three places instead of starting big. And they obviously look like the TV folks shot them. They feel small. They feel small in scope. Maybe occasionally there's a there's a big you know location with fifty extras in it or something much bigger than they would have had on the TV show. But that's why it still is a matter that uh, Star Trek and the motion picture are the first time a TV show really went to the big screen. So sorry, Batman. And that's not the case. That's much more stretched today. But it's still I still feel like the X Files movies. Maybe they had some big. Uh, there were effect sequences that may were much bigger than they would have tried to. Not so much space battles, but just the detail that they tried to bring and what they had to shoot, what they had to do when they shot. Uh, but I, we're definitely, we're definitely in this realm more than we ever have before. And maybe it would work with the live action. It feels like it just would keep the live action from being as epic as it might otherwise be. Still more epic than a 60s, 70s version. Uh, but good point. Oh, Brad's horse bite dream. Okay. That's where you were. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Daniel, you are happy with this Trek franchise sticking to TV. A fourth Kelvin movie would have ruined the continuity of the last three movies. You think so? I mean, we don't don't know what... I Yeah. A lot of folks, for a while, a lot of folks wanted something if not in a movie, then on TV that remerged the Kelvin time stream back. And, oh, well, speaking of meta. <laughs> Mariner's, uh, yeah, Mariner's uh, comment about the Vindictiverse. Um, yeah. What, what, what? We have an alternate universe with people playing our roles half our age? Another cast? That was classic. Star Trek 2009 wasn't too bad, but it's had its run. The movies are disposable. Well, hey, Sensation Black 1984, good to see you on Twitch. Welcome to Tuesday. Uh, you've probably long gone because I didn't answer you right away. Um, you know, the movies, you're, you're, what you mean are the Kelvin movies, because a movie can be anything. That's what we're trying to say. Uh, the Kelvin movies you feel like have had their run. Could be. I don't think motion pictures for Trek have. I just wish they would do something something cool. <laughs> no, really, tell us what you really think, Sensation. The only modern Trek that's of any use whatsoever. Uh, no, nothing, no feels for Lower Decks, huh? Okay. You see it as the go-to response to ex excessive fan wanking. Hmm... Wait, I've lost the train already here. You're talking about... Um, I've missed it. I missed it. I missed it. I missed it. I missed it. Okay, well, I'm sure you'll straighten me out. Um, hey, Steve Price, I think it's been a while. You heard talk that Cobra Kai may be building towards a movie follow and from the TV series, bringing the two... I think I, I think I saw that too, which makes sense. And even bringing 
Ralph Mock. Yeah, and combining the legacy movies in with the TV threads. Oh, you know what? Actually, no. I think people that had movie rights and they have no connection to the TV series were about to announce. We had announced or were about to, and it was making Cobra Kai TV series fans uh, gave them a sad because it was one of those situations where it was like the Battlestar Galactica movie the Glenn Larson still controlled rights to that would have nothing to do with Ron Moore's reboot series. Uh, I think that was, I think, I think this Cobra Kai situation was similar to that. <laughs> Lower Decks, the movie extravaganza. Yes. Well, Melanie, let's let's be precise. You don't like the non-canon Kelvin timeline. Even George Takei expressed displeasure at the way they changed things. Sulu's character was not gay. The character should not be changed on account of the actor's sexual orientation anymore than a straight uh, actor playing a gay role should change their real life orientation. Um, I didn't have a lot of long-term need for the Kelvin timeline. It's Let's just clarify terms, though. The Kelvin timeline, it wasn't that it was not canon, because we've had other... Can what you mean is it was not prime. It was not a prime timeline movie. It was a Kelvin timeline movie. And there is a canon. There's a Kelvin canon. There's a mirror universe, Terran Empire canon. There's a canon per timeline. So the Kelvin timeline is not a prime timeline. That's by definition. So they're all their things, but within the Kelvin universe, things need to stay consistent. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we've only had six hours on camera of the Kelvin universe, and we know where it originated, like the birth of Kirk, the premature birth of Kirk. So, uh, and the death of George, you know, the death of George Kirk, Kirk not born on Earth, yada, yada, that family aggrieved. And then as the years go by, you know, the loss of Vulcan and all that, that's, there are so few differences and, and the whole ramp up in tech for Starfleet because of all the knowledge gained from the sensors that survived all the scans made of Nero's ship. Uh, what was the scimitar? No, the scimitar was, uh, oh gosh, somebody will tell me. Scimitar was the last renegade Romulan who graced a, Star Trek movie. Um, but I hear you. I don't think they developed the... We've said this a billion times. They didn't develop the Kelvin timeline, so who's supposed to have an emotional investment in it? Unless it was your first Star Trek, and you can never take that away. But for everybody else, um, you know, you can appreciate... Oh, my God, you can appreciate Carl Urban. You can appreciate the good casting overall. You can appreciate how much that they kept how much they spent and how much they kept the franchise afloat in the fallow TV times during the divorce years. I'm so glad we're past that. <clears throat> Fluxy, what is this? Fluxy, streamy, watchy film period. These new times of how to watch TV and film. I feel like we can do anything now. Home box office means something more now. I guess so. You actually said home box office and not just HBO. There you go. Um, now what? Rutherford left the holodeck to replicate a sandwich, implying there's no food replicator in there. Maybe. Does that put an upper time limit on holodeck trap stories like ship in a bottle and homeward? Well, he left the holodeck to replicate a sandwich. Maybe it wasn't that there was no food replicator in there or he couldn't call it up. Maybe because it wasn't his program, he couldn't. Or maybe, maybe he didn't want, he was bored the whole time through. He didn't want to be rude to his friends. I think he just wanted to take a bathroom. <laughs> I think he just wanted the break to go out of the holiday, get a sandwich and come. It's for comic effect. If you want to actually want to time the seconds when he was last seen and when he popped back, it was probably like 30 seconds or less. But I think the takeaway is not so much that he couldn't make a sandwich, he may, could have left the scene. Do we even see? We don't see what he does. That's the joke of it. But he could very easily have called an arch, left, and come back just to signal 
not to signal, but just as an outward sign. He's not even thinking. He's saying all these things that could be hurtful to whoever's program it is. And he's not thinking about it because he's just, he's just Sam. So, you know, I'm not going to get all Canonista tech on the holodeck there. Uh, unless it's, if it's not your program, you don't have access to that kind of thing. Hmm. That's a wrinkle. Mm hmm. What are you saying here, Nathaniel? We need to free Star Trek. <laughs> a series that is available on non pay, non streaming service. And yes, I'm going to keep this up. We can do that. It'll be interesting. What happens when the perception of quality, though, what happens when the generations eke along enough that the perception of quality is that anything on streaming? has a 90% chance of being better quality than something that's up on that cheap pay. Uh, you, you don't have to pay, you know, it's free. So how good could it be? You know, the, the, the appearance of premium costing more versus, well, you get what you pay for. That will be interesting. Aside from like sports games and news. Well, news. Um, Fifty-seven. You thought that the Kelvin was to reinvigorate the franchise, and it has. So now let's run with that momentum on all platforms. Do you really think it's invigorated? I think it kept it alive. It kept it on life support for twelve years. No, for ten years barely. But I don't think it's. I don't think it's reinvigorated. The Earth. Oh. Count me in. The Earth Romulan War that was meant to be series five inter could be the subject of when I thought. Well, it was going to be. I've gone blank on the title. That was the uh the movie that the last thing Rick did going out the door that was commissioned that everybody laughed at and paid no attention to because Rick's time was done. And if anything, they were not gonna do any Star Trek and they sure weren't gonna do anything that Rick was producing those last few months. Jen dress it. Jen Dressett's uh, script. Uh, but I agree with you, though. It would be nice to have a whole season, even a short season, even a 10 season season. Actually, if it was if it was a season a year and you had four the four year war and maybe the year going in and the year coming out of it, you could have a six season, 10 episode show that would do it justice. I would like to get in there and slog. Uh, oh, I'm sure he's ready to. Now, is anybody ready to hire him and pay him a check? That's the thing. Hmm. Uh, hey, 57. Oh, there you go. Popcorn for everybody. Maybe a mini series based around it, but if you really, if you really want to get in and wallow through the days and the weeks and the months and take advantage of that slower feel for low warp, I know. Uh, low warp ships that the Romulan War was fought with. Excuse me, guys. You're not, you're, that's not an editorial comment on you. This is what, this is what I'm saying. Boom. Okay, Daniel, you're popping in here a lot. How about an Enterprise movie? So we can see some more of Caption Archer and his crew. Maybe a two-hour catch-up to the rest of the adventure. You could, uh, yeah, yes. You could set it a few years ahead to kind of, it's, you know, Kirk and company only had 10 years of real life aging to do. Archer right now, it's been 17. So you might, which is more than the year we last saw them. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe they get in. Maybe we do a little uh, CG. I'm not trying to be facetious about aging. I'm just trying to deal with, you know, the real life of it all. Uh, hey, David. What are you doing? One of your few Tuesday work from home days. So greetings. Yay. Just spread that around everybody. Whenever you're, whenever you've got a Tuesday home, which I would think these days would happen more often. So I take it you're going to weigh in then. Star Trek's always been stronger on TV than the theater. So any movie should always exist to serve the TV, not the other way around. That said, the line between TV. Uh, that's true. But again, I'm, 
I'm up for pioneering a new paradigm, but I'm just like the paradigm. I'd like to pioneer it by having anthology movies, but maybe that seems counterintuitive. Who would want to blow the money on even a medium budget movie that's an untested format? Well, the, the best thing you could do is, again, maybe you put some scripts in development and you uh, kind of see what, see what grows in the, in the hatchery. The Guardian of Forever. The Guardian just had a good article on how Marvel runs a successful movie franchise and how DC does not. Oh, I'll have to see this. I'll have to see that. I did see an interview with The Rock and Black Adam and talking about some, some, some things. I will have to check that out. Paramount probably has too much pride. Hi, Tom. I think you've been with us before, but if not, welcome to Tuesdays. Paramount probably has too much pride to do a low-budget Star Trek film and then look cheap in comparison to MCU. Well, that could be unless everything you did about it screamed, we're not trying to fight with you. It would help if they had a we're trying to compete with you movie, not fight, compete. If you had a big, splashy, space battle, epic Star Trek movie, hopefully does come out comfortably well but if you have one or two or three of those you, then you can come along and do a logan or do a cinematic one division or she i mean you could do something smaller where the world says we're not doing this because we have to we're doing this because it's an artistic choice in our toolbox of options we're choosing we're choosing to tell a smaller star trek it would be like following up best of both worlds one and two with family if you come up and you frame it that way, you're not trying to sneak anything by. Oh, look, we're having a space battle and we spent $47 on it. Uh, no, you're not trying to get away with that. We've recycled everything from the warehouses. Look, it's the original airlock gears from DS9. We still have them. No, no, no. Well, unless you're going to do DS9, that would be awesome. Um, but no, I think you could do it if it wasn't your first one out of the box. If it was your second or third one, preferably your third, because you've done it once and then proven it again, that you're not limping over here, and that everything frames it to where you let the world know, don't you think it's time for a more intimate Star Trek movie? Ooh, that's what you would do. And you kind of nurse the mundanes and the idiot critics. You kind of nurse them along to expect it. Uh, yeah. The captain's table, now whether they actually use these stories and pay those writers movie budgets, I don't know. But see, there's so many kinds of formats, exactly. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, he's going to do Sunkansi too. Sunkansi too. I can't even talk anymore. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing, dysfunctional, no big long-term vision. A movie could be the story of the Kelvin pre-destruction so that it could be both in the prime timeline and a sequel to it. Yes, bring back Captain Robaw. Let Chris Helmsworth be George Kirk being a first officer hero-ish. He'd be about 15 years older than he was when we last saw him, but you know. Uh, oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you there. Trek Files was great. Listen to it. Uh, yeah. Yes. Hannah was awesome. I, I kept, she privately was much more animated than she was on the mic. I was like, cut loose, cut loose. Uh, <clears throat> absolutely. Hey, Matt. Yes. The, the cruise was a special for cruisers, but it's not limited. I mean, if it fills up, I have two days of 18 people if that maxes out, then it's maxed out unless there's enough demand to actually add another day and people are, and a lot of those cruise people do come for a few days extra, just like people go to Vegas around the con and stay a few days extra. Um, but yeah, you can come jump in on one of those days or you can do your custom designed uh, trek. Um, Their season three is your favorite of Lower Decks. That could be true. 
that could be true. I mean, for a lot of people, not just obviously it's true for you. <laughs> uh, yes. Once again, those are you don't have to do the cruise to do those. You could jump in and be on the bus and not know anybody. Or maybe you do know some people. But yeah, it's not limited just to cruise people. It's limited to how many, how how soon till I fill up the 18. Uh, and there you go. You know what? I have not been big on flu shots. I might get one every eight or ten years. Just if I happen to hear in the news, it's expected to be a big flu season. And half the time, they don't know what they're talking. They can't predict. Sometimes they, pre you know, and it's not like it's a plot. It's just, it's random. It's science. It's random factors. It's, it's viruses. Some years it's worse than others. And sometimes they can predict that and sometimes not. I mean, remember the swine flu? I do. Poor Gerald Ford. Well, not poor Gerald Ford. He pardoned Nixon. But that really bit Ford in the ass too. People ridiculing about the swine flu. Um, that was the first time I ever saw medicine be politicized. But um, I only get the flu about once every 10 years. So that's me. Uh, hi, Mike Richards. My goodness, are you new? Oh, Mike, you're going to hate me, I'm sure. We've met. This is new to two first Tuesday. I should start there. Whatever. Whatever. It's good to see you. Uh, let us know where you're coming from. And if I should know that, then, then bad on me. Uh, no, we are. No, no, no. Cadet, I'll, I, other, other, <laughs> other end of my acquaintance circle. No, Cadet Alice is not getting a sister cadet uh, or brother cadet. Uh, but thank you for asking. Uh, I just need to get Cadet Alice back in the studio pretty soon. I think we're working on that. I think we're working on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hashtag renew the Orville. Sure, throw it in there. Um If, Christoph says, if Disney doesn't renew the Orville, P Plus should buy it. Actually, they should buy it either way. You know, aside from the personal comfort, everybody knowing each other and homaging and all that, I don't, I don't know if the powers that be at Paramount Plus are ready to stomach that. I don't know if the suits are ready to stomach it. I think the hands-on people would think it was a hoot. But I don't know. I don't know. Really thirsty today, gang. What are you saying here, Matt? You just returned from a trip to Frankenmuth, Michigan, visiting your cousin Roger on Weiss Centennial Farm. Okay, is, are you like, do you have brochures? Descendant of German Lutherans who landed in Michigan in the 19th century and still run a 100-acre dairy farm with 80 cows, corn, and soybeans. And when you ride a long post, it doesn't all show up in the window. Bucket off. Oh, reaching out to our continental folks. Yes, absolutely. Wow. You got a Nielsen survey in the mail. <clears throat> there were 25 real money in the envelope. One question is, what's your favorite TV show? Of course, you wrote Star Trek. W which one? That's interesting. That's interesting. How about a Wii update on the Con of Wrath? I can give you a Wii update. We are talking with some folks who might help us get it over the finish line in a more structured way than us plodding along with it. Uh, there's your Wii update. I don't want to jinx anything, obviously. <clears throat> actual. Actual. Ah, an actual question. How do you dress for the Bajoran Gratitude Festival? With thanks. With thanks that you have clothing. <laughs> you asked. You asked, David. <clears throat> ah, you'd take any Star Trek movie they'd care to make. But top of your list is Lower Decks. Well, that would be cheaper in many ways uh there's no location shooting unless we go mary poppins with it you know or tom and jerry with it um oh did it, oh yeah from france well come on mike how hard how hard is it to do 
<laughs> a Coneheads impersonation. <clears throat> Scantily, there's that. That's right. If you're thankful for a wedding on Bejor, it would be, yeah. Uh, live action crisis point to paradoxus. Ooh. Ooh. The next movie should star Zaheer speaking in third person as a rogue Starfleet captain and Larry as a crusty admiral who is not what he seems. Uh huh. Oh, hey, Ali, I think it's time for you to uh, slide in. This seems to be about your time of the show. Pick my brain about what I know of Star Trek premiering in other countries outside the U.S. and Europe, Japan, maybe. Um, well, I've got no, no special insight aside from always being surprised that Star Trek was not bigger in Japan. It's amazing how the countries where Star Trek is big outside the U.S. Canada is it goes back to, and despite what has been tried to do, especially since the Kelvin era and the movie, that's one thing the movies, the Kelvin movies brought was a worldwide approach to the box office and trying to plant the Star Trek flag in countries where it hadn't been before. And they would do those in-person, round-the-world PR tours and premieres, even before they opened in the States. They'd be in all the Southeast Asia countries and across South Asia and around, I think, even Africa, too all those markets they're trying to get into. But it goes back to why, okay, England, okay, the UK, but why Germany, why Australia? It's because those, those are the places when Star Trek, the original series, was first offered to syndicate in the 70s globally. Those are the places, nothing to do with Paramount. It was the places where the local programmers saw the show as adult and not kids. If it was put on in the kitty show hours of the day, like, I don't know, Italy and France and go down the list, and probably Japan, maybe, then the world, the culture, as it came in, couldn't help but see it. It's totally new to them. Oh, that must be a kid's show. So for 20 years, 30 years, it's a kid's show because that was the first place it went. It just happened to be that, especially like Germany and Australia, the uh, first people that bought it to show it in their countries, put it at the adult hours. So that was the vibe that came out. So I guess that didn't happen with Japan. This would be a fascinating history to get into. So Ali, I don't know. There might somebody might be down here. I thought I saw something in the in the in the. Uh, let me look real fast. <clears throat> this just broke uh, some details. Just came up. Uh, Oh, come on. Let me go back to... I couldn't do this. I thought I saw something about um, some original Trek program coming to Asia this week. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Paramount Channel Asia, Strange New Worlds and Discovery, only in South Korea. Some of the original content, the fourth season of Discovery. <laughs> Why not the first three? First season of Strange, Short Treks, and from Strange. Uh, Paramount Channel Asia. Some of the original content. Uh, huh. I don't know, on cable and satellite. So I don't know. Maybe it's cable satellite. <clears throat> but that's, I mean, I'm just reading the Trek movie story here. So there's that. And I'm going to see the rest of your comment. Hello. Well, I know, I know you were up there evangelizing for Star Trek on your own. And yeah. You're just, it, you're swimming upstream, Ali. I know you're trying to get there in the military community there on Okinawa uh, and just outside the Daystrom Institute. But, um, I mean, you know, good on you. Keep doing what you can do. At least you're servicing, you know, the homesick Americans who want their Star Trek live. That's good. 
but whatever outreach you can do, it's just, it's just hard. I, and that's, that's, that's fascinating me for ages. Now at the big beyond the May 20th event in 2016, when they tried to jumpstart the promotion for the delayed beyond movie that was racing to be out in time for comic-con and, and have a summer release ahead of the 50th in September, but be a summer movie. I, one of the one of the trivia winners was a young woman that bought Bo's staff. I'll never forget this. And I interviewed her for the magazine and I've got the tape, but she was from May, she was from PRC, right? Yeah, she was from mainland China. And I was kind of shocked that not only did was she a Trek fan, but she knew all about it and she was able to travel easily. Of course, that was six years ago. I wonder if it's so easily well, pre-pandemic on top of that. But I was really shocked that someone from um, you know regular China now, communist China, was able to be, not just travel, but be a huge fan. But I just know something about East Asia, Japan, China, apparently Korea, some inroads. I don't know why Korea more so than Japan, but there you go. There you go. Um, but hang in there, girl. You're doing good. <laughs> hang in there. I don't have any special insight. Yeah. And yeah, I it dawned on me. I've only watched it once. I need to go back and watch again. I was going to do that last night for a second opinion, and I've still got to do that. <clears throat> what are we at? We're at 306. Okay. Um, you're guessing the movies aren't being watched. Doesn't matter if they're the family jewels. If the jewels aren't bringing home the bacon, they got to go. Uh, that That's it. If you take the subscriber base of Paramount Plus and when people are on Paramount Plus, they're watching the series. Uh, I don't know. It's Paramount Plus is just not big enough. It's, But it, it brings back, we think at times, we think of the past movies as just more chapters of Star Trek. But in the real world, in, in the big picture, the casual viewers, if they don't want to get involved in the plot, especially the streaming chapters, if they don't know Impenetrable, Next Generation, or DS9, if they didn't like watch original series in the 60s and then nothing since, if they have a fondness for the originals, or even a fondness for TNG but nothing since, they might do that as a one-off, but they sure don't want to get involved. A two-hour movie is much less threatening. But I'm thinking your average Netflixer or Prime person, that's more their... You know, they're getting more ad Trek adjacent, fan adjacent, casual viewers, armchair fans, even adjacent armchair, than they are people with Paramount Plus. If you're Paramount Plus, you're, and yeah, you'd like to think it's there, but actually the, the smaller pool of numbers. And then even of those who are Trek people subscribing, they're doing it for the new series. And, you know, oh, let's watch an old movie. Now, not everybody, but I'm just saying enough. But again, you're starting with a smaller pool of subscribers to begin with. So, and if it's, if, if the counter, if the meter is how much do we make on these, if they can grow Paramount Plus, if, if Netflix withers a little bit, and I don't know about Prime, but if, if, if the paradigms change, uh, that may happen. And maybe this is a two, three year growing pain of things. We'll see. That's my, that's, yes. It's, uh, yeah, Darren's comment there sent me that direction so now i kind of understand i can see that i can see the reasoning doesn't matter what the promotion people think it's what the what the bean counters are saying okay christoph even if paramount plus makes more money from trek movies on other streamers well see paramount plus is not paramount paramount the big it's like Paramount TV was not all of Paramount. Paramount Pictures was not all of Paramount in the old days. Paramount Plus is the streaming channel. And they are originating some original Star Treks and other things. But they're not everything, you know, and the legacy products, the series are easy because there's a billion of them and who's going to, but movies can still be standalone. What I was just saying, if you're thinking of average audience person, Maybe they're not. I want them. I'm going to watch Star Trek three today. What's my binge calendar look like this week? That's that's fans. That's like you guys. Average viewer doesn't sit around with their binging calendar. 
they <laughs> and have a debate online with their 50 closest Twitter friends about what to do next, casual Joe Blow and Jane Blow are just going to sit down and see what pops up. And there are a lot more chance of that happens on, on Prime or Netflix. Um, and as far as the exclude, yeah, and I would think they would make more with exclusive than non-exclusive. Uh, but the exclusive would be general purpose. The exclusives would be Netflix versus Prime versus, I don't know, Apple. But not the other, not not Disney. Well, I don't know. I started to say not Disney, not the other branded you know, content makers who are a recognizable brand, not just a broadcaster, aggregator, streamer. But, you know, I'm. this would be an interesting, I'd love to find somebody who could talk to this. Live action movie with reasonably, I did get you guys talking. Look at this. Live action movie with reasonably priced producers, performers who are not recreating established roles with the Star Trek logo is fine. And I'd pay my stupid $50 for the theater. $50. But TV has the same emotional value for me and it's plenty cheaper. Well, that's, yeah. TV has the same emotional value for you. Michael, and it's plenty cheaper. You don't even have to leave your holodeck to get a sandwich, <laughs> right? Or climb over, yeah, climb over the letterbox. Wow, Matt, you really threw out the third JJ Drake place before. You really didn't like, uh, I, I think my whole attitude about below is based on the two clips that we got to see at that beyond that May 20th event that day. Cause I was like, Oh yeah. A lot of the rest of the movie kind of slid back into when we had to rehash the beastie boys and motorcycles. I was like, oh, okay. Maybe that's what you're thinking. Oh, it's the 50th anniversary. So we'll have 50 alien makeups, elaborate one-offs that we'll never see again. Remember the shellhead woman? Where I want to go to her planet. I want to see a hundred shell heads walking around. So suddenly it doesn't look so cool. It looks, it just blends in because that's what the people look like. Oh, Christoph, on the other hand, you've bought most truck movies four times now, even five in the case of the motionless picture DVD, DVD special, BR, you mean DR? I don't know. Uh, 4K, 4K remastered. The 4K boxes both have the non-4K BRs too, so make it seven. Okay. 50 bucks for a cinema ticket, and I thought London cinemas are expensive. Uh, I had the same thought. <laughs> fan, fan wankers are us. Uh, okay. Um, letting everybody self-market today, so there you go. Uh, now what, William? You're thinking about doing a video log fan film? Be playing Ensign William McCoy, Joanna's son. Wow, we're moving things along. So you're going to be mid mid 24th century. Hmm. Okay. There can be no adequate Karate Kid movie without Pat Morita, who passed away. Alternatively, there really there could easily be a successful Cobra Kai TV show about LaRusso and Lawrence. There can be a CK movie, but never again a KK movie. Well, all righty. <laughs> this is why I only have one real fan base because I can sit back and let everything else just kind of watch the show go by, get my popcorn and go for it. The Kelvin verse can be the evil mirror verse for the Lord X movie. You mean the Kelvin verse or the mirror universe of the Kelvin universe can be the, okay. Uh, oh, it was a what if movie. Okay, okay. Thank you, Scimitar was Shinzon's ship. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, Shinzon, right. And Nero's was Narada. You know, I would have thought of it in five or ten seconds, but I just wasn't going to. I mean, I try not to think of these things. But at least I waited personally through the Scimitar. Mm. I have a wonderful picture with uh, John Logan. 
on the scimitar bridge, except that we had no flash and the bridge is black behind us. <laughs> nice control C, control V action there. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, hey, Dave. Well, I guess we'll let you stay then. All righty. Okay, Matt, I feel like I need to duck. If you eat hollow food, how will the holographic emitters get into your stomach? And then what happens is if it, food and hard props, it's just like a, it's a hol holodecks include replicators and transporters, gang. So if you want something to be solid, if you want real food, you could holo you could replicate. You could replicate something just like you're standing in front of a replicator machine in your own quarters or at the whatever bar is on your ship lounge place um if it just needs to be fake then you're saving on your energy use and you just have a paper mache turkey on your thanksgiving dinner if you're really going to carve that turkey then you make it real replicated turkey your issue might be with replicated turkey but it'd be the same thing you get out of your wall slot and then what happens to food just same thing that happens when you eat replicated food from a wall slot uh, which is why the whole thing about about uh, Rutherford leaving the holodeck to get a sandwich is really funny. It's just it's hand in hand with his you know his involvement all the way through. Uh, hello, back to you, Tom. Again, welcome to Tuesdays. If you haven't been with me before, the end of TNG should have destroyed the Enterprise D. Then the new ship in generations. Yeah, but see, then after that, a series eight. Then the TV production would have got the darker stage lighting that they wanted. Well, on the other hand, they're thinking, well, one thing, the, the budget to destroy the D on a TV budget would have been huge. So they did it much better on a movie budget. And they're trying to, they're trying to bring people, they're trying to pass the baton cinematically, which is crazy. But in the mindset of the time, they were trying to do it from the Kirk era to, you know, and it, it was cut way down from what they were eventually, because they didn't have any everything. They didn't have enough for the entire cast to do. So it wound up just being the three who would put the, the two, Kirk and Shatner, and the two who would put up with it, Jimmy and Walter. Dee and Leonard didn't want to put up with it, and Leonard wanted to direct. And in the Berman way, here's the script. And Leonard's like, well, no, I'm a director. This is Star Trek. Different ways of doing things different eras of doing things. So they were worried about the continuity. It was the cost first. And then even the continuity that you're going to make on one hand, you make audiences come to the theater to see. They didn't know if audiences would come to a theater to see Picard and company. That was, that was the handoff. That was part of the, in hindsight, we look back and go, well, duh, of course they would just give them a good story and they will come. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you guys, you know, do a breakout room. <laughs> and take that outside. Uh, a small dot alone, wandering and wondering what its real purpose in life is. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to let you guys debate replicated food. Let's see. Oh, Rose. A request if anyone can help you need to know how to do a zoom chat but private if anyone knows please put your response on instagram or say yes on instagram uh you 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 mean don't you have a chat but you're not broadcasting it just don't share the link just share the link with whoever it is you're wanting to talk to and don't broadcast it publicly and that would be my first answer There we go. At least for two plus food. Oh, it's the hot dog. Hot dogs will be more than your, your, your Coke will be more than your hot dogs in your ticket. <clears throat> the Romulan War was fought using Epstein drives, PDCs, and rail guns. Okay, random Matt. I'm, why do I feel like I'm back in your podcast now? What do you make of the enthusiasm for TNG movie following the buzz from the trailers? Uh, well, what else was going to happen? If that, it was amazing to me how sentimental that Picard reunion, I, I said this in second opinion. I didn't mean to bash anybody. 
but it really got me how fan. I mean, they've had reunions at cons for 10 years and I know not everybody goes to a con, but they did it. They were, they were, <laughs> their agent was, I mean, it was year after year of the 25th anniversary stretched into the 30th and beyond. The last thing I thought was that anybody was dying to, I mean, of course you want to see them all back together again, but the depth of the hunger was like, wow, people, They've been all over the world together. Where were you? You're in New York seeing them now. They've been in New York in the last 10 years more than once to see them. So if there could be that, what are you going to do? Throw cold water on that? No. It's given that, apparently, yes. And they were sounding it. And you know, sometimes actors are very flip and sometimes they pile on and sometimes they these things actually do change. Sometimes it's more led by the fans, uh, a.k.a. give us a Pike show with Anson Mount. And sometimes, you know, sometimes actors who are in, in their skin, <laughs> who fit comfortably there and they know their position and they know their icons, if they can squeeze one more out of it, you know, this isn't Marina arguing with Rick and being threatened to be replaced. For the third or fourth movie, this is a cast that knows where they stand and with the public. And after the 19th person just stood in the Q&A line and said, we're so glad to see you again. I was like, I thought they'd been together for the last 10 years. But... Um, well, never underestimate, David, the power of actually doing it. I mean, remember... <laughs> Leonard famously was not going to go back and do Star Trek, the early movies in phase two, or I'll do the pilot and then not continue. And I'm just saying, never say never. <clears throat> we would hope they would go with either a discovery or a strange new movie after either series build up his assets. Certainly Anson Matt could carry a movie. No. Oh yes. Obviously it would be interesting if we eventually have a three track If we have, TV reward movies, whatever that turns into. We have animated movies from whatever that turns into from the shows. Maybe we have one-off movies the way we had one-off short treks animation. Maybe you have anthology animation. doesn't have to be live action. It'd be a lot less costly and a lot less uh, risk recognizant. <laughs> it's our word for that. Uh, you know, of, of cost and involvement and emotional involvement. You don't want to fall flat on your face. Um, well, Narda, I guess we'll let you stay. You're very welcome. If Ferran Tahir is unavailable to reprise as Roba, there's another coming short, stocky Pakistani actor. Of course I know him. He's me. <laughs> uh, why would Ferran Tahir not want to, um, not want to do it again? <clears throat> First Tuesday, Mike, did I miss something? Did I miss something? Um, oh, the Xenti Wars were fought with Bowman Drive, Zat guns, and Marita rifles. Someone's been reading, someone's been reading their Niven. I've heard this, Gay. I've heard that the uh, COVID booster and the flu i've i've heard people being knocked out more on things going around this time than than any time before you said we david i mean i could have gone on and on and on but that's that's basically it right uh renew life support lives michael th hello michael and uh thank you for that um we have to talk to the Ali network on that one. Uh, and probably we talk to the Nimichek network too, because uh, uh, we're both doing things that are really time consuming. Um, but we're talking about specials. We want to do some one-off things live as well as online too. So we just got to get there. We just got to get our new, got to get the new plateau that's not something in the middle of a pandemic when the rest of the world stops and lets you take a breath and do something. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm glad everybody's getting to um, <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, you know what? It's it's fine. It's fine, Glenda. I wasn't as late starting as sometimes. Um, let's see. Let's move along. Wait, what? What, Galen? The new Big Bang Theory has a few new Star Trek stories regarding Mimoy Wheaton, etc. The new Big Bang Theory? Am I not talking about the series coming back? Is this a book, a comic book? Is this a podcast or something? Um, oh, the new Big Bang Theory book. Thank you. Okay, now I'm with you. <laughs> Wasn't even thinking about guest stars, but there you go. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Christoph, for forwarding that over to the Facebook people. <clears throat> Big Bang Theory book by Jessica Radloff today. There we go. And Adam tweeting about it. Okie dokie. Uh, looks like we've got even more. Regarding TV versus movie budgets, were they a lot less in the mid-90s than now? Uh, TV or movie? Yes. <laughs> I mean, if you had a movie could spend a ton of money but it'd be like an epic in the old days it would have been a cecil b DeMille ten commandments you know we're gonna flood we're gonna do the crossing the red sea the flood we're gonna do you know whatever it's gonna be around the world in 80 days and we're gonna shoot on location around the globe it's gonna be it's i mean that's kind of it wasn't like routinely because the big budget movies and the blockbuster thing have squeezed out the mid-level budget people just want to come along and make a simple little romantic comedy or a little a chick flick or a, even just a drama study just have some actors doing some acting in domestic situations and maybe i mean those have been squeezed out a lot of them have wound up on some of the streaming channels like gone to netflix and and prime uh so good they were being squeezed out totally people complaining that they couldn't do a 10 15 20 million dollars it's got to either be tiny and be a tv movie be a Hallmark movie, or it's got to be huge and have somebody with a cape. That's kind of what it got to. So yes, uh, the budgets were a lot less in the 90s than they are now. Uh, apparently somebody hasn't watched The Expanse. Do you mean the Enterprise episode? The difference was that this urine was streamed somewhere people could actually see it. Oh, that, Scott. <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking about the people live. Yes, the streaming added a quote. Yes, but that's going to be true of everything now. They've had reunions streamed also in their Zoom boxes. So somebody at home reacting emotionally to the fact that they're all sitting together on a stage versus watching them virtually in their own virtuality. I mean, that's interesting. But I'm mainly talking about the reaction of the live folks in the live Q&A line was, and me watching, sitting at home watching it. Uh, either way, it was a fact. It was a thing. I mean, can't argue with it. it. It happened. That was people's perception. Never, never second guess the power of armchair fandom. Who's always saying that? Linda, you think a lot of it was the, oh, that they were, they were actually going somewhere, that it wasn't just a one-off event. Uh, that's, I guess, that's the best theory so far. It was the juice to come. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to let you guys talk about your German sci-fi. Uh, let's see. Oh! 
There we go. Yay. Then good to have you with us. <laughs> a little slow, Mike. Sorry. Because I, I at times do a thing called Third Tuesday, and I'm like, wait, what? 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 So anyway, glad you're here. Uh, I would even ask how, you, how we do marketing and say, how did you find us? But it's good to have you with us. I know I've seen your name, though, flying by on Twitter or somewhere, maybe, or something, Facebook, but glad to have you here. <laughs> Support live the movie. Now, what would that be? Yeah. Uh, where did she go? She's just having a life. You know, she was modeling and acting, and maybe it was just... You know, maybe she did what everybody else told her to do and what she thought she should do. And now she's having her own good life. So not everybody's life is made up of acting, auditioning, running social media, getting a convention agent, you know. Life support live. The retreat, the cruise or the con. Yeah, see, we lost Jared. Um, yeah, the Kazinti on the Slaver Weapon animated. Yes, exactly. Uh, oh, the retreat was always going to happen. Every week, the retreat, uh, that was the joke, the running joke on Life Support Live. Jared would usually pop out where the next retreat was going to be. Uh, basically, here you go. Yes. And there you go. Got married. She married money, got kids, does charity work, Africa. Maybe if she did a to Paul and she and if she wanted to give the charity money to one of her charities. You know, people people leverage that. People do that kind of thing. She can be a Roger Moore if she wants to be at that point. Yeah. I think they meant that there were sections in the overall book that mentioned the Star Trek related people. I think that's the, uh, I think that's, it's not the whole book. I, I could, I could understand that one. Oh, it seems like the margin between TV and movie budgets has decreased. Rings of power look. Yeah. Um, that's true. It's why they call it cinematic TV. It started with Game of Thrones, and now that bar has has raised. Yeah, and the you know the CGI worlds are able to be more seamless. The the AI, you know the um, and well, and now Trek's doing it too. But Star Wars, right? The uh, AV wall, where they're able to oh my god, bring all that in without having to go back and mat and composite out windows. You can have the space dock outside the conference room window, the way Strange New has done. It's kind of amazing. I mean, I think nobody on a modern show has to go to Impulse before they go in their conference room. <laughs> you do the thing. Next Generation always goes to Impulse right before a meeting because they don't want the... They, it's expensive to have the streak. It, you could tell it was an important story point if the stars are streaking, if the warp stars are going by outside the observation lounge on Next Gen. Uh, they would find some way to drop to Impulse first. Uh, and there you go. You've heard this already. Yeah, you know, a real book. Not just more fiction, novel fiction. Uh, oh, I hope we're approaching the end of the chat. Um, we did meet in Vegas and Chicago. Yes, Mike. See, your avatar here is very tiny, too. So, apologies, apologies. <clears throat> oh, Mike! See, these... These are my hands doing my egg impersonation. Mike, I'm so sorry. But I'm not sorry to see you here. Jesus. Okay. Color me all shades of red. You know, every time, this is going to be funny. Every time I see your name, Mike, I always think, wait, did Mary have a brother? I don't, I think... I more show which is not fair it's just a weird little crippled neuron in my brain that does that and you know what i'll never do that again well 
I'm glad you could make it to Tuesday, Mike. <laughs> Please do not uh, shun me now. Oh my gosh. These avatars are tiny on here where I'd otherwise just know. Um, yes, for all of you Life Support Live veterans, Jared is doing a Zoomy chatty thing later this month. Maybe this Saturday. It's a Saturday-ish time, I think. So go back over to the, the Life Support Live page on Facebook is still there, and I'm sure it's posted there. And I'm, I'm going to try to get by. And uh, we've... <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> I mean, fellow, fellow fellow Roddenberry podcast person, compatriot. Uh, yeah. Well, here's the thing, 57. I also meet real life people who have tiny avatars that I should know better. Anyway, I think this is the end of the chat, gang. Are we at the end of the chat? Did we stir up any interest, any thought-provoking angles on movies? Because basically right now, unless there's just everything is cut and dried and wrapped up with a bow on the inside of New Paramount HQ, it feels like there's just all kinds of, not flailing, but like think tanking and focus grouping and, and rebuilt turf competition going on to exactly, and, and a lot of pie in the sky thinking without anything on the ground about what's going on. So um, maybe this has been interesting to see. We'll see. Uh, anyway, good to see everybody today. <laughs> you too, Mike. Uh, once again, though, I do want to thank all of our Patreons, right? our Patreoners, and if you want to become a live wire, if you want to join the TTO club, you can get in on the 5 or $10 very simple tier at patreon.com slash Live. There we go. Um, it's bills once a month at the end of the month, uh, so there's time to still get in for this month. Thanks to everybody who's helping me slowly grow the live system here. And yeah, this week, the Trek Files. We have Hannah Louise Shearer, who came midway season one. She sold a story. She pitched three things. And of course the thing she put the least. Clearly, clearly. Um, it was only there a half season, but any thoughts on the years she saw after that, including her pitch on DS9, which she has no memory of. Go figure. It's a lot of fun. And just a reminder, you don't have to be on the cruise. Don't have to be, boom, on the cruise to join us for LA Away Days, uh, February 23rd or March 3rd. But it's set up just for cruisers, especially. You can jump in, too, if you can get yourself to LA. Uh, it's a special regular schedule. Um, Vasquez Rocks, Tillman, Starfleet. Um, I have to think, uh, the Hollywood, uh, reservoir, Franklin reservoir, which is Miramani's planet. And one more that someone I'm sure will remind me about. That's that. Of course, the big, big, big one, 10 days in July, Geek Nation tours banner. I'm leading it. Terrace will be along. That's 10 days in LA and San Francisco with actors involved with day trips with us, uh, actors and other behind the scenes folks. We'll have a guest at least one a day. And it will be related to one of the stops in the day that we make, including our trip up north. Um, hope, hopefully, we can put some really exciting things together that way. Most of all, just have your antenna tuned. I'm going to be announcing who and when exactly is coming in November for our seventh anniversary open house for Portal 47 when we open the guest night telebriefing doors to the public. And we even have a sample Ask Dr. Trek roundtable. It's kind of like basically an open mic. Um, like this, only we're on uh, cameras a little bit. But that's going to do it for today, gang. Hey, I am Larry Nimichek on Twitter and Larry's Trekland or Larry Nimichek's Trekland on YouTube. Please like and subscribe up there, as well as Instagram, as well as, yes, even Facebook. Um, and Larry Nimichek on Twitter. I think I said that. Portal47.net, if you want to just dive in and check out what's going on with Portal 47. The tour information that's coming up, you can go to LarryNimichek.com 
check out the links there and you know what get on my list if you're not already there it has been dormant a few months but with everything ramping up here i'm behind to relaunch the newsletter um or just re get, get back into being regular again with all of that going on and especially with open house coming up in november it's going to be uh going to be a swell uh winter and then i think we've got real star trek coming prodigy don't don't think of prodigy as just a kid's show gang it's um it's about to get very real and very canon focused if you know what i mean we're going to start fleshing out the early the early 2380s leading up to what happens eventually i'm i'm not saying this in specifics i'm just saying between lower decks and prodigy these years are going to get fleshed out and don't don't look askance just because they're animated because there's all kinds of effort going into tying the shows together where they need to be that's going to do it for us. So thanks for joining in, especially all our new folk today. We'll see you next Tuesday, if not sooner, somehow. <laughs> Just, you know, stay healthy, stay woke, and uh, track well, everybody.